Many lives will be lost to them my hunger means it It's way bigger than the pain that I place on the CD If I told you all the truth would you really believe me? It's still my hunger means it It's still my hunger means it How many lives will be lost to them my hunger means it It's way bigger than the pain that I place on the CD If I told you all the truth would you really believe me? It's still my hunger means it It's still my hunger means it My hunger means it meaning African Holocaust Cause we pay the hell of a cost And don't really know what was lost And the process ain't ever stopped Since black civilization dropped For internal greed and external plot The same ones that taught the ancient Greeks Greece and Rome helped bring to the knees Then Islam spread across northern Africa With slavery and massacres Too many hurt, refused to convert Spread south and west, people dispersed Christianity's not alone In using race and religion for power to expand Desert caravans took slaves across sand Where they staged a revolt at the Zanj Enemies always invented mythologies Curse of Ham, so-called prophecy After the migration, there was some reinstatement Of autonomous nations Then floating on the waves of the seas Came a plague, a genocidal disease With arms and heads, they looked like men Really they were just dogs on two legs When they first came, some of our people said go Most welcomed them into our homes We didn't know, they had hearts of stone Frozen by Western Europe's cold Also, there were scumbags among us Willing to work for white conquerors on us With that collaboration began the largest forced migration In the history of All right, so a very warm welcome everyone to our 10th session of the Decolonial Learning Sessions by Adales. We are a pan-decolonial network and organization based in Amsterdam. My name is Max, and today I'm gonna go into a conversation or also listen to Esther Sanford Xosse uh, to talk about pan-African and decolonial perspectives on reparations and what is and why it is necessary to look at holistic reparations and what it would entail in practice. Um, The import, uh, this is an important topic because as you all know, colonialism has uh, had a huge impact on the world that we know today. And reparations is a way forward, a vision also, uh, uh, yeah, a way to look at the solutions a way ahead so we can move out of this uh, colonial legacy. Um, we will look at specifically at the way that colonialism has also impacted the African continent and African peoples. Uh, both as diaspora, but also on the continent, and how can we decolonize it, the power structures, understand it better, but also how can we repair the harms done, uh, experienced uh, historically, but also in today's world, and the group-based injustices. Um, so we will have uh, Esther Stanford as a speaker today. Uh, she's a Pan-African uh, reparation scholar, activist, Uh, as a legal specialist, scholar, activist, media spokesperson, environmentalist, historian, educator, trainer, mentor. And it's very special to have her today. Um, I was uh, privileged enough to have uh, a masterclass followed one uh, time by her for two days. So I know she has a lot to tell. Uh, so I'm really curious what we can learn in this hour. She will first give a lecture. Uh, if during the lecture you have any questions popping up, you can type it in the chat and we'll be happy to respond uh, to these questions. So, uh, and for us, yeah, do make notes. Um, she will give the lecture about 40 minutes. Then we go to your questions from the chat. We will have a short break after that. And then we go into conversation with each other uh, in breakout rooms. Um, so yeah, uh, having said that, Esther, I want to give you the floor. Okay, thank you, Max and Narales as well for inviting me to do this session. There's a lot to cover and I have a habit of going over time. So I will just make a start on it. But before I do, I've got a, a presentation that I would like to share. So I'm going to share my screen. And also I need to share my sound, which I believe I've done as well. Just hopefully you can all see um, the presentation. If there's any difficulties. Are you hearing me okay? Yeah. Yes, we can hear Great. you. Okay. So um, you've already been given an introduction, but I was asked to really do a presentation for you today. Um, this being the lecture part that covers the following questions. How can we better understand the impact of colonization? reflected in today's world and power relations, specifically by looking at the consequences of transatlantic enslavement for both the African continent and the diaspora. 
what would reparations for this massive crime against humanity look like? What are examples of initiatives and efforts made to stop and repair this harm on an international level? And how does African reparations relate to struggles of other peoples who have also experienced historical and contemporary group based injustice? So that's what I aim to cover in the time that I have, and I will move swiftly on. So this session is billed as looking at Pan-African and decolonial perspectives on reparations. If some of you have heard me speak before, maybe I haven't always um, articulated that the perspective that I speak from is, is a Pan-African and a decolonial perspective, but hopefully it should become obvious as, as we go along. So how is coloniality showing up in reparations movements? There's a lot of coloniality in, in reparations advocacy today, especially the way in which the corporate media actually portrays movements and also in terms of how some movement activists articulate what the struggle is. So these are just a few examples, reparations programs and measures that uh, re-marginalize, deprioritize and minimize the lived experiences, expertise and epistemologies of indigenous African communities. Um, that's a key one because a lot of the time reparations is just seen as an issue that is relevant to people in diasporas from an African um, standpoint. And it's not recognized that reparations actually began, the movement for reparations or repair began on the continent of Africa and that there are um, cognitive justice implications to the meaning of reparations. Also the reproduction of colonial logics of commodifying human beings, labor, space, and knowledge. So today, the dominant focus in the case of African people's reparations, however we self-define, um, is often reduced to how much money um, we are owed, okay? And that is often based on the price of enslaved uh, African people, that not that was set by us, but that was set by enslavers and colonizers, or what was deemed to be our value on at so-called abolition and so forth. And so a lot of monetary sums are based on very, very um, capitalist figures um, and uh, devaluing of actually the worth of human beings that many of us accept and actually reproduce. Uh, the promotion of policy proposals that obscure the interdependent and causative relationship of the development of wealth, the wealth of Europe and Abi Ayala, the so-called Americas, and the underdevelopment and impoverishment of their past and present colonies, epitomized by calls to narrow the wealth gap in Europe or North America, for instance, where it's most coming up, especially in the so-called North America, North Abiyala, which ignores the imperialist dimensions of wealth extraction from the global south. And what I mean by that is when we look at the wealth gap in so-called North Abiyala or North America, and there's a lot of statistics that show how families of African heritage have less wealth intergenerationally than say their European counterparts, so-called white counterparts in North America. But what is not factored in is actually the role of the US empire in terms of it being an imperialist state that actually has benefited from the extraction of wealth from the times of chattel enslavement through colonialism, right down to modern day neo-colonialism. And so the, world, the wages that workers are entitled to or fight for is often at the expense of people in the global South. And if we look at, compare that to how much families say live on in certain parts of Africa, South Africa, even though it's one of the wealth that, you know, the wealthiest countries supposedly in Africa, you will see a huge difference. So the point is we have to look at the world as it is that has been shaped by imperialism. And uh, studies have been done 
by economists to show the trillions of dollars actually that have been extracted from the global south since the 1960s we're not even talking about historical enslavement or even colonialism reliance on neoliberal status approaches which reinforce the coloniality of power so by that i mean the notion that you can have reparations for a people that transcend the borders of Europe and North Abiyala in particular, uh, including um, the Caribbean so-called, that you can have these separate struggles that somehow, because my family happened to live in England where I was born, that somehow that makes me British and that my struggle for repair is disconnected from all other African people and my family members that are not British, that don't have British passports, they may have an American passport, may have a passport in a Europe, another European country, may have a passport from a Caribbean country and so forth. And finally, although this is you know, just all I can say in the time that I've got now, the NGOization of reparatory justice uh, resistance. So these are the ways that coloniality is showing up in movements um, for repair or reparations. So I'm going to move swiftly on because still a lot to cover. And so I begin with some key terms that I'll be using that are uh, from a pan-African perspective and also a decolonial perspective in terms of um, defining what it is that I'm speaking about. A lot of the time terms like slave trade get used. It's not a term that I personally used and many other activists who are reparations activists use because it's not language that comes from us as African people. It is language that came out of global Europe to justify the dehumanization and the bondage of African people and to deny culpability in terms of our rights to repair. So Ma'angamizi is a key Swahili term. It's important if we're talking about decoloniality to, to look at part of colonization has been to deny um, our indigeneity as African people, our um, right to a mother tongue, uh, African languages, the, the, you know, and to speak a language is not just about what we say, it's about the ability to, to dream and envision. And some you know, terms are just not translatable um, in the way that we use English. So English um, as a colonial language, even though yes, many of us speak it, we can't discount the way in which it, uh, English has been part of the violence, the structural and the epistemic violence. And so uh, part of the repair, from cognitive justice standpoint is to reclaim African languages to define our reality. Just like Jewish people refer to uh, a Shoah, uh, Palestinian people refer to a Nakba, and um, you know, we as African people refer to the term that some people may be more familiar with is Ma'afa, which is another key Swahili term that means a great disaster. Uh, but I use the term Ma'angamizi, which has been popularized by Professor Malena Karenga, because this term Ma'angamizi really speaks to the intentionality of, of a destruction of a people. Uh, at which he uses the term a holocaust of enslavement. And by this, he means the moris, morally monstrous act of genocide that is not only against African people, but also a crime against humanity and a sin against our creator. The morally monstrous destruction of life, human culture and human possibility. So um, Ma'angamizi is a key term. He also, um, teaches us that when we categorize Mangamizi as slave trade, the injuries that African people have faced, experienced it during chattel enslavement, colonialism and modern day neo-colonialism are distorted and hidden. It sanitizes the high levels of violence and mass murder that was inflicted on Africans and our societies. It becomes more of a commercial issue than a moral one. And since trade is the primary focus, the mass murder 
uh, and genocide can be simply attributed as being collateral damage of a commercial venture gone wrong, okay? So that's why we use Ma'angamizi and I am part of a campaign that is called the Stop the Ma'angamizi We Charge Genocide Ecocide Campaign. So moving on, what is the harm of the Ma'angamizi? There was a very famous conference in uh, Abuja, Nigeria in 93, and it was called the first Pan-African Conference on Reparations for uh, Enslavement, Colonization, and neo-colonization. And it came up with something that called the Abuja Proclamation. And this is just a paragraph from that proclamation. The damage sustained by African peoples is not a thing of the past, but is painfully manifested in the damaged lives of contemporary Africans from Harlem to Harare, in the damaged economies of the black world from Guinea to Guyana, from Somalia to Suriname, okay? And uh, similarly, in COBRA, the National Coalition of Black for Reparations in America has identified and documented what they refer to as five injury areas suffered by African people during the Ma'angamizi. Uh, so even though uh, Professor Karenga refers to the Mangamizi more in terms of chattel enslavement in the Stop the Mangamizi campaign and the Pan-African Reparations Coalition in Europe, which is my primary organizational formation. We refer to the Mangamizi as a continuum of chattel colonial and modern day or neo-colonial forms of enslavement. But these injury areas are injuries to our sense of peoplehood and nationhood, i.e. being able to identify as an African person, even though, yes, we know that there are different African ethnicities and nationalities, but what we have seen over the centuries is the development of this notion of a global African identity as well. So injuries in terms of education, injuries in terms of healthcare, uh, injuries in terms of criminal punishment or criminal injustice, and of course, wealth and poverty or impoverishment. And this also connects to uh, what we have been taught by um, those that constructed terms that we use today, such as genocide. So Dr. Raphael Lemkin, who was very instrumental with, with developing the 1948 Genocide um, Convention, also was concerned with how groups get destroyed. And so he very much was looked at the, the way in which culture or cultural genocide is a key mechanism for this destruction of a group. It's not just mass killing directly. So you can have a people that are in ex existence in that they have survived, but they have gone through a genocide. And I love this quote um, from Raphael Lemkin. Genocide has two phases. One, the destruction of the national pattern of the oppressed group. The other, the imposition of the national pattern of the oppressor. And what he meant is that genocide was about destroying the institutions, the value systems, the cultures of a particular group, but imposing upon them the same of the colonizers, okay? And that is what we can see across um, the African continent, the African diaspora, but in truth, we can see that in um, all peoples that have experienced forms of genocide, okay? So I'm now going to move on and I want to play you just a little snippet because uh, it's also important to recognize the eco side, what we would call eco side today, which is something that African and other indigenous peoples have always recognized that the destruction of people is also uh, a destruction of the earth, you know, that sustains life. And there's a short clip that I'd like to play, play for you. It's about a minute and a half of a recording that I did that, that speaks to some of this. And when we talk about ecocide, we have to recognize that part of the way in which ecocide has manifested has been because of the genocide of people who were custodians of our earth whose ways of life was about living in harmony with all creation and all our relations. And that is what has got interrupted. We 
So that was a recording that I, an interview I did. Um, somebody who put something together for the BBC, but it was actually a snippet from a speech I made at an envi uh, environmental protest of Extinction Rebellion in the UK at um, their rebellion last September. And I'm also a part of Extinction Rebellion in terms of the International Solidarity Network. So that making those links between the harm that has been done to us as people, and in particular African people, who are the mothers and fathers of human uh, civilization, but also how that has resulted in damage to our earth mother that sustains all members of the human family. So showing the beginnings of what today is being referred to as the climate and ecological crisis in the plural and its roots going back to the beginnings of enslavement and colonization, not just of African people, but of course the indigenous peoples of Abya Yala. Okay, so, uh, this quote I love from Bell Hooks because she reminds us that actually this is for me is really great thinking about decoloniality um, because a slave's idea of freedom and many of us have internalized a slave's idea of freedom and of course to the so-called slave or enslaved person the master's way of life represents the ideal free lifestyle. So moving on to what is being advocated as repair, looking at my time. So this is a, a quote from Professor Rebecca Sosi, who is a professor of law um, of the Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy Program um, in the United States. And she is of Yaki descent. She tells us that the framework for understanding the role of reparations for natives uh, nations, indigenous people basically, necessarily must be intercultural. It must account for the different historical experiences of native nations with Europeans that colony, colonize these lands. And it must address native epistemologies. The key thing here is, she says, there is no uniform theory of reparations that fits all cultures, all nations and all peoples. And I think that's key. And what she's really identifying is that different people, depending on their own story, their own journey, what has happened to them, define reparations and basically organize and agitate for it to bring about whatever those reparatory justice changes are according to their own cosmo visions as well okay and then uh, another quote here uh, from some other law professors african-american who uh, are professors Ajua Aritoro and adrian davis professors of law and they say part of the largely untold history of reparations is the struggle not only for reparations itself, but also the struggle between distinct black classes over strategies for citizenship and the right to envision the racial future. So what they're saying is that even amongst people of African heritage, you will not get a unified notion of what repar uh, reparations are because some people, believe it or not, saw reparations as having a black man head of the White House. So there are different notions and some, uh, you know, the oldest notions of reparations for African people have been actually the right to return to our homeland where, that we were stolen from, trafficked from, which today is often called uh, repatriation. Those are the oldest sentiments around reparations because it was like that was how it was articulated that the, the harm of stealing us and uh, dislocating us from our lands and our families and communities and sense of peoplehood um, that could be repaired by a return, a physical return, okay? So I also, from a, a decolonial perspective, very much advocate that there can be no reparatory justice 
for whatever group, but I particularly speak from the perspective of African reparations without global cognitive justice, okay? This is about transcending our Euro literacy, which many of us are, and instead of being Afri-literate, so colonization has made us into another people in many instances. And we can't underestimate the harm that has been done through um, disconnecting us from our languages and our heritage, our indigenous African heritage as well. So speaking to cognitive justice, this is about recognizing that we need to repair the knowledge that we use to actually engage in social transformation, okay? And the knowledge that we have been using has been largely within the perspective on reparations, that is, has been largely within the perspective of Euro literacy. And we have to repair that. So we have to go back to how did our ancient ancestors envision that repair? And what does that mean for us generations on who seek to base our right to repair on what happened to them in terms of the foundations of it, okay? So, um, so African reparations is something that I particularly uh, promote uh, as an aspect of Pan-African reparations, but not all people who are articulating reparations for people of African heritage and ancestry would define as Pan-Africanist. That's why I called it African reparations. And this really speaks to uh, approaches to reparations that harmonize the different approaches that people of African heritage on the continent and different sections of the diaspora have been articulating, okay? And notions of African reparations include um, the reclamation of Africa, including the land, uh, the right to belong to the land, and Africanness or African identity, as well as the pursuit of African liberation from the Maangamizi of chattel colonial and neo-colonial enslavement, and effecting planet repairs. And I will explain what that is, uh, as being central to the strategies and tactics of reparationists. That's what African reparations are about. So African reparations do not start and stop with how much compensation we uh, are entitled to as a result of uh, chattel enslavement of our four parents and ancestors, colonialism and uh, neo-colonialism, okay? So these are just some slides that visually express the meaning of reparations, because from a decolonial and pan-African perspective, have to keep emphasizing the meaning. Uh, so we recognize that reparations is really goes back to the root of the term repare, to repair. That's what it means. Um, and that there are internal dimensions, meaning what intra-community, yeah, what communities themselves have to do or owe each other, okay? But also there, there are external dimensions, which is what others owe us, governments, corporations, in, international institutions, particular families, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other one is a placard at a uh, reparations march that uh, happened in uh, London, Repair Nation is reparation. So these are just visually showing you some of the thought processes of African reparationists. But aside from that, um, we recognize uh, the Chimwezu framework from an African perspective on reparations. And Professor Chimwezu was at that conference in Abu Jar I spoke to you about in 93. And he wrote about a paper on reparations and a post-reparations world order, actually. And in it, he identified that reparations are about holistic repairs. And on the slide, it lists all the different types. I haven't got time to read them all out, 
um, but all these different repairs um, that we need in order to restore ourselves. And he actually goes on to say that more important than any monies to be recovered and any lands to be recovered is the opportunity that the reparations campaign offers us as African people. And he talks about for the rehabilitation of black people by black people for black people, okay? And I mentioned Planet Repairs. Now, Planet Repairs is a particular formulation um, that has been developed by PARCO, the Pan-African Reparations Coalition that I'm part of. And this refers to, in the case of when safeguarding the rights of past, present and future generations to repair, that is, the need to proceed from a standpoint of pluriversality that highlights the nexus of reparatory environmental and cognitive justice in articulating the impetus to repair holistically our relationship with and inseparability from the earth, the environment and the pluriverse, giving due recognition to indigenous knowledges in contrast with Western centric enlightenment ideals that separated humanity from nature and thereby justified exploitation for capital accumulation. So planet repairs is a, a combination of the, you know, the, the move at the moment, linking the fact that the harm has been done to not only people, but also to our planet, our mother earth. And this has come out of the thinking and practice of pan-African reparationists who have been involved with environmental movements, as well as racial justice movements and so forth. And so Planet Repairs is that formulation that we have been working with in the UK and which has uh, been embraced by um, mainstream political parties such as the Green Party uh, that uh, in the UK in, in October of last year became the first British political party to embrace African reparations as we have articulated it um, as Stop the Mangamizi campaigners and also to support our calls for uh, a process known as the All Party Parliamentary Commission of Inquiry for Truth and Reparatory Justice. <coughs> so this is a quote from another African organization uh, in the UK. And what's interesting about the UK is that you never hear us talk about reparations for black people in Britain. It just doesn't exist. We've always, whether we've been born in Britain or claim a black British identity, whether we've come from the Caribbean or other parts of Abiyala or even directly from Africa, we've always articulated a pan-African position on reparations. And this is a quote from the African United Action Front that is no longer in existence, but they say reparations is a process, not an event. The objectives of reparations cannot be fulfilled by a mere transfer of resources from aggressors to their victims, although that is one necessary objective in the process. In fact, reparations begin with Africans reclaiming ourselves, returning to live the African personality each day, reclaiming the African source, and recognizing that African culture is the main tool for the liberation of the African people, and that reparations is fundamentally a process of self-emancipation, okay? Okay, in the last few minutes I have. Um, so as PARCO, the Pan-African Reparations Coalition in Europe, the primary coalition that I'm part of, uh, we have identified seven political goals of a Pan-African um, reparation struggle. And this is surveying the movements for reparations as they have been articulated from, I'd say the mid 1400s, okay? all over the world. So the first being to learn about, recognize and stop the Ma'angamizi, including the horrors of enslavement, colonization, neo-colonization, recolonization, which is actually happening today, and other imperialist and foreign impositions on Africans at home and abroad, including forced Europeanization and Arabization. 
to counter Afrophobia, which is anti-African prejudice and discrimination as a manifestation of white supremacy, to eradicate African dehumanization and reassertion of what uh, people like Osajifo Kwame, Kwame Nkrumah identified as the African personality, okay? Which is some of the aspects of what makes a people who they are to restore African sovereignty by redressing with uh, Ma'atu Buntu Mandla, and that is a Pan-African government of people's power. It's not the African Union, which is the current governmental political bloc for the continent of Africa. And we have to repair the disrepair in our power and usher in a fundamental change of the existing world order that would bring about new geopolitical realities such as our strategic goal of achieving uh, a pan-African uh, superstate, a uh, union of communities known as Ma'atu Buntuman. And this is an anti-imperialist sovereign pan-African union of communities, okay? Now, another um, political goal is to achieve systemic change globally. This is how we're gonna ensure guarantees of non-repetition of the Ma'angamizi. Um, not just for ourselves, but also everyone else who's been impacted by the Ma'angamizi. Now, systemic change to globally ensure the expropriation and redistribution of ill-gotten wealth, resources worldwide, to implement new paradigms of so-called development, including a new legal, political, and international economic order, to institutionalize Ma'at and Ubuntu, in terms of global justice for all, to enforce the environmental elements of global justice, such as full respect for Mother Earth rights or Mother Earth law, as has been articulated in Ecuador and Bolivia, uh, that we refer to as, you know, in the Akan tongue as Miano Nana Asase Ya rights. So this Ma'at Ubuntu man would look like an Africa without borders and that would incorporate Africans in the diaspora as well as a sixth region today that we are called. And this is a participatory democratic polity of Ma'at, which practices Ubuntu in relation to her people, all of humanity and the cosmos. And Ma'at is identified coming from the knowledge systems of African peoples of Kemet, so-called Egypt. And these are the virtues of Ma'at, truth, righteousness, harmony, balancing, reciprocity, justice, and order. This is the ethical ideal, just like democracy came out of Greece and Rome. It's an ideal. It actually hasn't really been fully realized anywhere. And so Ma'at is a similar notion of how Africans have conceptualized that we inhabit the earth and how we relate not only to other members of the human family, but also the earth and the cosmos as well. And also the notion of Ubuntu um, coming out of the um, Bantu speaking peoples of Southern Africa, which literally means that a people are a people through other people, meaning we don't just express our humanity by being within our group. Our humanity gets expressed as well in terms of how we interface with other people outside of our group. So this is known as an African humanist uh, philosophy. Um, that is recognized in the constitution of South Africa. And so what we're saying is a proliferation of Ma'atu Buntu uh, throughout, not only on the continent, but throughout the world. And we also refer to uh, Ubuntu Dunia, which is a, a multipolar world of global justice, which is a world that actually has all other peoples in it that are also going through their own repair processes. So we recognize that our repair as African people is not just about us, it is a civilizational task because our repair has and is catalyzing the repair struggles of all other peoples who've experienced settler colonialism, colonization, 
um, and other forms of imperialism. Now, these, uh, as um, just in the last two, three minutes, where I'll end, uh, in terms of a, a pan African and decolonial perspective, we talk about uh, African satellite um, communities that are linked to the motherland Africa. So, for instance, those of us that live in Britain, we form a satellite community that we refer to as Ma'atu Buntu Jamas using African language. And these are basically African heritage communities where we've come together out of our differences because we've been all born in all different places, we speak different language, we've developed different identities, but due to Pan-Africanism, we've learned to live together and coexist as one African people. And these satellite communities are directly linked to communities on the continent of Africa that are also going through the same process and uh, liberating Africa. And so we have a structure in Africa called Matubuntu Mitao Gafric, where we, they are also based in uh, Ghana, where many of us are actually going through rights of uh, what's known as rematriation. Some people would say repatriation uh, to reintegrate back into African communities where we've been separated for hundreds of years. So this is the vision of actually a unified pan-African perspective. And it's decolonial because we're not saying that Africa, we don't want to preserve the borders of the Berlin Conference, okay, that have separated indigenous African ethnicity and nationality from each other. We're saying that Africa itself is in a process of self-repair. And many of the struggles that you see and conflicts are because people are reasserting their right to their own indigeneity. So we have to find a way beyond uh, preserving these borders that are actually structurally violent and further um, the Ma'angamizi. And so this notion of rematriation is an indigenous concept of all indigenous peoples on the planet. And it refers to restoring a living material culture to its rightful place on Mother Earth, restoring a people to a spiritual way of life in sacred relationship with our ancestral lands, reclaiming our ancestral remains, spirituality, culture, knowledge, and resources. Okay, and these are just some pictures. Um, this is a brother on the right hand side who is based in the UK, born in Jamaica but has rematriated into a community called Avatime. And these were his um, rematriation rights and going back and getting connected onto the land. Now, for those of us that are not gonna physically return to Africa, it's also about developing those bonds and links wherever we are based. and also articulating our right to have a relationship with land, but also recognizing that depending on where we are, that we're also living on stolen land or captured land, and that we also have to honor the peoples, the first peoples who's, who have always uh, had custodianship, not ownership, but custodianship of those lands, okay? And, um, okay, and I, I, because of time, I'm just gonna share with you just uh, one or two things that have been happening in the UK that show that this is not a theoretical perspective. It's actually something that we're working to. So every 1st of August, as people will refer to it, but we've renamed it Mosiah after one of our leading um, Pan-Africanists, uh, Marcus Mosiah Garvey. We have an annual reparations activity protest uh, between 2014 and 2019, it was a reparations march. In 2019, we evolved that tactic to the Pan-African Reparations Rebellion Groundings. Uh, groundings as championed by the late Dr. Walter Red Rodney that are about how you engage with the masses in society around you know, knowledge co-production in the struggle to bring about a new world, essentially. And every year we have a theme 
And this year, the theme is Defeating the Ma'angamizi of Neo-Colonialism with African Autonomy. All roads must lead to our sacred cause of reparations. And we recognize that neo-colonialism is that structural system you know, connected to global white supremacy racism that is keeping our people, our nations in bondage today that we have to end. It's not about coexisting with it because neo-colonialism is a system of death or a death style uh, uh, rather than anything else. And so these are just some of our slogans, rebel for reparations. I've already explained to you the political goals we have Ma'atu Buntu Man in Ubuntu Dunia to build and recognizing that um, this, this is a multipolar world that we're fighting for. And to demonstrate that we had, uh, even though this is an African led um, you know, protest uh, that we have in terms of the groundings this year and last year, it has been supported by our colleagues in Extinction Rebellion who assisted with actually blocking some of the roads in terms of civil disobedience, because what we're also saying is that we, however, the, the changes we want to bring about in the world cannot be done by taking lawsuits and diplomatic strategies at the UN, that actually we're gonna to have to rebel. We're gonna to have to rebel against the system, but not just to tear it down, but to bring about or prefigure that new world. And the first of Mosiah or August, is how we demonstrate that we are actually prefiguring Ma'atu Buntu Man by bringing together African people from all across the world, as well as with our allies who don't, who are not African um, today, uh, but who support this struggle because they also recognize that the world of global justice that we are seeking to bring about is also in their interests and going to benefit them. And there are many members of the human family, even from people groupings that have oppressed us that actually are struggling to bring about a new world. And I will stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Esther. This was really lovely and insightful. And what I always love about your talks is that you open us like an imagination beyond Eurocentric visions and solutions uh, because they are out there. It's what I really love. And also the solidarity that is always in your talk, opening up uh, ways for other people's groups to learn from this, to find their own way for reparations. Um, and also that you uh, work within communities to not make it only an abstract knowledge for you and those who have time to read, but also give back and organize. Uh, so that's what I really love about your work and can hear through it. Um, yeah, you're getting some applauses also in the chats and there's questions. So please do ask questions in the chat uh, if you have them. I also have some questions after this. Um, so one of the questions and then I'll, then I'll go to the chat that I was just curious about um, when you said about uh, restoring the African personality. Uh, something I hear a lot also uh, or many times in the in the Dutch context from a diaspora context some of my mm -hmm. friends who have Afro-Caribbean roots for instance uh, it becomes difficult to restore such an African personality in the sense that their history sometimes stops at the boat right so who were mm -hmm. the ancestors you don't have direct access to a certain language or culture etc because it has been cut off so where does one start from that position when trying to restore um, yeah, what you called an African personality? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And that would apply to me also because um, I was born in Britain. Um, my mother was born in Guyana, in Abiyala, South Abiyala. My father was born in Barbados. Um, but I now today claim an African identity. When I was born, I did not. Um, I, I would have called myself black or African Caribbean, but how we do it is that we take that journey back in terms of connecting with whoever our people are. So for me, it was not only about learning about what people like me had done in Britain, because by the way, the movement for repair 
in Britain goes back to the mid 1700s. So not only did I have to learn about what have our people done in this country, but also I was fortunate enough to, uh, in terms of both my parents, be taken back to the countries that they were born in. And what you will always see is Africanisms or African retentions in the different communities that we are part of, right? And But if you don't know this history, you don't know that that's what it is. So there are many things that we did um, culturally, spiritually, just customs, even some of the words that we use in our, you know, patois uh, and so forth come when you actually begin to learn about Africa and Africanness, you will realize these are African retentions. And you have to be courageous enough to go on that journey of de rediscovery because it, nobody's just born an African. Af being African is not just about where you're physically born or what your, your, your lineage is. It's about whether you connect with that lineage. And so even people on the continent are having to learn what it means to be African because their identities have also been colonized as well. So it's not like they're all okay. You know, if you're calling yourself a Nigerian today, Cameroon, Ghanaian, whatever, that's part of the coloniality, because a lot of the times these nations were created by global Europe. So it's a read a journey that we take together and people begin that journey from where you are at, but you go back through your line, your parents, your grandparents, your family members, your community history. And then you, you know, you, you begin that process and it's a lifelong journey, okay? A lifelong journey. And for many of us, it might begin in symbolic ways. Like when I was 16, wanting to lock my hair as a way of getting back in touch with, cause I've done it all, weaves and all kinds of stuff, hair extensions because of not feeling comfortable with who I was in my skin ultimately because of being brought up in a world that you know valorizes whiteness and when I began to become become more comfortable with who I was I began to instinctively do things that put me back in contact with my people my heritage and the ancestors speak the ancestors speak to us whether we recognize them or not they show up they show up in dreams, in visions, they show up in nature, they show up in people that come as messengers to help us get back on our path. Thank you. Thank you, that was beautiful. Um, what I was also thinking when you were speaking is that you said there's also this problem of um, uh, you know the coloniality on the continent itself, because you, in the one of the last slide you showed this beautiful tree coming out of Africa mm. and this network, and then the borders being erased. Yeah. Um, so I know within the yeah global reparations movement, there has been also some nation states, for instance in the Caribbean countries, uh, asking for reparatory justice. You have the UN, do you have some developments there how reparations can look like? So I'm just curious, how does it Either, yeah, uh, uh, can there be tensions within that? Yes, because there still, are. There definitely is it, are. Is it helpful or is it not? How do you look yeah, at that? No. Yeah, that it can. Uh, Absolutely. Um, that's a great question as well. I mean, a lot of people now, 20 years ago, people would have been hearing about what was going on in America. Now, a lot of the um, writing and the media focus, they'll talk about CARICOM um, in terms of the Caribbean. Now the CARICOM program is not a decolonial program and it's not a Pan-African program because unlike the Abu Jar process, which was also state, I wouldn't say led, but there was a lot of state involvement coming out of the, the then organization of African unity. They recognized enslavement, colonialism and neo-colonialism. The CARICOM pro program talks about really chattel slavery and native genocide. There's no recognition of neo-colonialism today, which means what we've done on our watch. Remember with that earlier slide when it said reparations is also about the internal repair. So yes, 
uh, we know that what Europe has done in terms of the Caribbean, but how can we have a, a reparations program where African people were trafficked to the so-called Caribbean, where indigenous peoples of those lands were exterminated. And some of those people still exist, in particular in countries like Dominica, a few, Trinidad, and Tobago, and Guyana, that has a significant indigenous population. And so actually, uh, when we work cross-culturally with other reparations movements like uh, 12th of October is coming up. So we work with lots of groups from the Abya Yalan diaspora, including so-called Afro descendants or people of African descent in Abya Yala, but they are talking about what Columbus did. And so we can't really um, disconnect from the indigenous um, Abya Yalan perspective of one America. We want, <laughs> America is one, the Caribbean, can't cut itself off because the majority population of the Caribbean were taken there, trafficked there as a, as a result of chattel enslavement. And that meant the genocide of indigenous peoples that inhabited those lands. We don't correct that by saying that, well, you know, we've become settlers now. Our claim actually connects back to Africa because it was African people that were taken to the Caribbean. That's what the tensions are because the Caribbean case formulates it as a Caribbean case, yeah? As opposed to a case of different peoples who are in that region and the struggles are different, yeah? They are totally different. And so those tensions do come up. Thank you. I think uh, we can't have like the answer to everything, but it does make clear raising these questions uh, to understand it. Yeah, the how complex it is actually to get to solutions. And also in the beginning of your presentation, the coloniality within reparations. So to always think, uh, yeah, to not use the term too easily. Yeah, too easily. the coloniality yeah. is that we think we can be repaired by trying to coexist in a world that has been created by global Europe as a, you know, that has resulted in dispossession of so many people. That cannot be repaired. That's why indigenous peoples talk about sovereignty. You know, Aboriginal people talk about sovereignty. That's a reparation struggle. And they argue our sovereignty never ceded. Those 512 whatever nations in so-called North Abiyala are saying, we want America back. We don't want to live on reservations. So those of us that were trafficked to these lands and were implicated in that project, not through a fault of our own, but because of colonizers have to also do the right thing. And know that part of our struggle is to find common cause with those who were struggling to restore their connection to land. So the notion of 40 acres and a mule, for instance, you hear indigenous uh, scholars say, hang on a minute, but it wasn't their land to give away. So even though we argue that we work the land and we're entitled, we have to find a way to collaborate and coexist and work out how do we share now the lands that we have come to inhabit in a way that is just and doesn't further the colonization. Thank you also for giving that example. I want to move to some of the questions in the chat uh, next to the applauses that you've been given. There's one uh, clarification question uh, that says, what is exactly meant by peoplehood and nationhood when you use the term? So um, I think I'm seeing this thing about not being indigenous and that, you know, reclaiming say Machapuche, I agree with that. In terms of people, it is who you are, your identity, your culture, your heritage. So indigenous, I know there's a lot of contestations of whether we use that term. I'm using it because I often speak to global audiences, some whom will relate to it, but I do take the point. So it is about going back to indigeneity in terms of the way in which people have defined themselves, their creation stories, their, their journeys of travel, who they were, what their cultures are, what their heritages are, how that their cosmovisions, and so reclaiming that. But for some people, 
especially those who have experienced African enslavement, it might be difficult to trace back to an indigenous grouping. And so it means that we've had to develop pan identities, so pan indigeneity, pan African identities um, that are often a fusion or amalgamation of existing pre-colonial nations as well. But as I said, um, you know, quoting Professor Sosi, there's no uniform theory that applies to all peoples in terms of their repair. And actually, I think there's a lot that we as African people can learn, even though we're the mothers and fathers of, of humanity, right? But there's a lot that we can learn from how peoples in Abia Yala have reclaimed their peoplehood and their sense of nationhood that goes beyond these kind of Westphalian models of statehood, but they're based on, you know, uh, belonging to a group, um, belonging to a land and having a relationship. Thank you. I think you've started to answer also another question that was posed in the chat and I see a, a heart symbol. So was it answered Chow, this way also for you? Yeah, thank you so much for this clarification. It's really a struggle. It's a journey. And I really want to, you know, not impose uh, definitions uh, towards mm -hmm. other uh, indigenous communities. Um, but it's also like interesting to see how other groups are reflecting uh, uh, about their identity and about the journey. And um, I think we can learn and we can uh, learn so much from each other. So I'm just listening and learning. So thank you so much for this reflection. Thank you too. And you're right. It, identity is something that we shouldn't impose. And many people reclaim identities in terms of fragments sometimes, but sometimes the, these groups have been able to maintain. And remember, we're not talking about going back into some past, all culture, it, you know, renews itself, you know, and transforms itself. So exactly. even the notion when I claim Africanness, I'm I'm talking about a futuristic identity as much as I'm talking about a connection in terms of ancestry, because the people who are African and what Africa will look like fifty years, a hundred years from now, if 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 we if if you know if we survive it as as human beings, mm -hmm. is is who who knows, and mm -hmm. that's the beauty of it. It's an expansive identity that that is transformative. It's not a static one. Thank you, uh, Esther. I want to give another question from the chat. Uh, and then if there's another question, drop it down. Otherwise, we take a short break and we have enough yeah, sure. uh, space for more conversation. But there was someone from Guyana um, and she was uh, curious if this uh, is also is if this conversation, the way that you are putting it, is also having its roots, finding its roots there. So there is a, a, a Guyana reparations movement. Um, there's a Guyana reparations committee or commission, I think they call themselves, um, that's led by people of African heritage. Uh, unfortunately, it's the conversation is not unfolding in the way that I've expressed it. Um, so what, what Guy, uh, African Guyanese are arguing for is they want a right to some of the lands. And they will say that, well, indigenous people have recognition of custodianship of certain territories in Guyana. And because African people also work the land, that they should have the same. So there is still a way to go in actually having complementary approaches that don't end up kind of um, competing or reinforcing stratification that was really perpetrated by global Europe. So work in progress, but on the environmental front, which is another angle to which the reparations is happening. There's some great work happening um, in terms of, uh, you know, Guyanese, indigenous, Indo-Guyanese, African Guyanese, who are basically working to say, this land is our land and we want to stop all these oil companies basically extracting the bowels out of the earth when Guyana actually can teach the world 
about how to live sustainably. So there's a lot of progress happening on other fronts. A fair deal for Diana is the campaign that I'm talking about, and we're also working with them. All right, thank you. I see another heart popping up. So uh, that means the question has been answered and something has been learned and taken from it. Um, then I want you to introduce the song maybe uh, that we're gonna listen to during the break. Can you tell us oh, something? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a song by, it's a, a remake of a song called Not Yet Uhuru by somebody called Leto Mbulu, who's a, who was an anti-apartheid activist. And Uhuru means freedom in Kiswahili. And so the song is saying not yet, we're not yet free. But the group Sweet Harmony is a younger group that gives a nice kind of flavor to this song. And it just reminds us that the struggle is not over, yeah? that we still have a struggle, a, a beautiful struggle to wage. And that, you know, this is how we sustain ourselves and the resilience that keeps us hopeful and being able to, to re-envision um, the kind of world that we are seeking to bring about by way of repair. And we have to remember to inspire ourselves through this long road. And so hopefully this song will the sweet music to your ears. like the last chance to ask questions but i would also like to hear if somebody would like to share something that they really found insightful or helpful uh, please feel free to share and if you still have it with a uh, question attached to it you you're also free to uh, 
uh, ask it to Esther. Um, yeah, you can also unmute yourself or do it via chat as you like, but we are recording this last closing part as well. So just so you know that if you are shy for the recording, then uh, uh, just know that uh, that's so. Mm. All right. Then maybe um, I also have one question, maybe uh, when we're moving towards closing uh, and Please feel free to uh, ask the question if you like. Uh, but Esther, how uh, can we uh, move in solidarity? How can we support you as well with what you're doing as being in the Netherlands? Or what is a way maybe good to create networks of solidarity that are focusing on reparations? Uh, uh, what are ways or strategies uh, and links to make internationally? Yeah, sure. Um, so that's a great, a great question to ask. I did have a slide at the end that said some things that could be done, but I'll just share one or two now. So um, in the Netherlands, we also have a, you know, activist that we're working with. Um, so there's a structure called NGOCA, the Europe-wide NGO Consultative Council for African Reparations for African groupings or people. Um, but then in terms of cross-community work, there isn't a structure that exists. So what I would say is, I mean, it's great. I've, you know, this is not the first time I've, I've come on to a session like this. And what I really value about and why I agree to do this is because my work, even though fundamentally I work within African heritage communities, I've always done cross community work because I believe in internationalism. And I believe that, you know, the struggle for repair also involves working with other people who are engaged in repair processes. So that being said, I think what's really important is for us to keep, um, you know, the processes of knowledge exchange going, learning from each other, because as I've said, a lot of my own, you know, as an activist and as a, a scholar activist, actually, um, I learn a lot and I read a lot and I process a lot of information about other people's struggles. Yeah. In terms of how people do the successes, the failures, because that gives examples and can also inspire when I'm going back to my community to say, look, they're doing that there. So, for instance, there was a story the other day I saw about um, a, a nation in uh in, in North Abiyala, where the school board had agreed that young people from that particular, I don't use the word tribe, but that's the word that some people use, but from some ethnic uh, nation groups um, indigenous to North America, allowed children to stay off school to engage in their traditional ceremonies, which were parts of rites of passage. Now that doesn't, you know, a lot of people of African heritage and ancestry who are trying to connect back to our culture, send our children into rites of passage programs, but there's no way it's reached the level of mainstream recognition where our children can get time off school. So that's just a concrete example of how a group struggle for recognition, autonomy, and reclamation of aspects of their sovereignty um, bring about policy changes that we can use around the world to show it's possible because so and so is doing it. Okay. The other thing is that um, I spoke, I speak a lot as an activist uh, working as part of the International Social Movement for African Reparations. But we recognize that the ISMAR, as the acronym is, is part of a wider internationalist movement that we refer to as the PRIM, the People's Reparations International Movement. And that's basically all other people who've got reparation struggles. So we have to continue to build our movements because it's movements that bring about the progressive changes in society. It's not individuals, it's movements, it's communities of resistance. And we need to find ways to be linking our strategies and tactics as movements because the kind of world that I want to see, I know is also a similar kind of world 
the other reparationists who are engaging in discourses around sovereignty, for instance, land sovereignty, food sovereignty, all different kinds of sovereignty also want to see. So when we're dealing with people who have denied all of us power, we have a common interest to find ways to relate to each other so that we can create the political will and the cognitive kind of acceptance that another reality, another world is possible fundamentally. Um, we have the Stop the Mangamizi campaign. Um, we encourage people to engage with that campaign. Um, you know, put on events like this where we can talk, we can learn from each other. Um, there are ways in which um, the struggle can be supported by supporting local organizations that might be engaging in initiatives and discourses such as what I've been talking about today. There are many different ways that you can be of um, assistance. If you're a researcher, we're always looking for researchers. One of the aspects of our own strategy that we're trying to bring about is an alternative world court which we refer to as the People's International, in English, as the People's International Tribunal for Global Justice. The Ubuntu Gotla, because we must bring about new legal institutions, just like with the, the, the Nazis and the Jewish Holocaust, they did not rely on Nazi courts to, they had to have a Nuremberg Tribunal. And the case that we want, that the, tri the kind of people's tribunals that we're working on is not just about the African case. We want our cases connected to the case of so-called indigenous peoples who go by many different nation names and groups who were also dispossessed and exterminated and so we have a common case and so the vision for the Ubuntu Gotla People's International Tribunal is that we will have representatives of all the peoples that have experienced European settler colonialism and that we develop our own alternative tribunal new methods of justice, you know, not just based on punitive justice, but restorative justice, reparative justice, and that we will have justices from Aboriginal communities, you know, different nation groups, Abiyala, African groups. And it's by doing this, we build the power, the dual power to be the change that we want to see. I'm a fundamental believer and advocate in people's change from the ground up. Thank you, Esther, that's beautiful. And I really love this tribunal idea. So that might be an effort that once it succeeded from the ground, doing it from a non-European yeah. way of, uh, of, of defining what justice can be, then that can something, something maybe translated in different yes. forms in different situations. In fact, so we don't have to wait for the big tribunal. What yeah. we're arguing is that we can have local benches you can yeah. have one in the Netherlands there, exactly. you know, the, we're, we're not, we can't wait. We're not waiting for anyone to do this for us. Wherever there's an institution um, that wants to help with this, offer the resources, offer the space, get the people on board, get the communities, get the scholar activists, and that we do this. And that's how we, we delegitimize law of conquest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's how we do it. I think about this one and maybe stay in touch for this one. I, I really love the idea. I, uh, and also the one about uh, cross-community organizing. I think one of the things we are trying to do now as an organization, because you mentioned the 12th of October, we're actually also mobilizing yes. around that day here in the Netherlands. On the 16th, we're still working on an English translation where people power short still <laughs> to have it in two languages. Yeah. But, um it's uh yeah so we also try to see this 1492 as a symbolic marker or beginning exactly. and exactly. to use that as to connect the different struggles and uh yeah we're we're mobilizing so that's really nice but i had a beautiful question about this also from one of our allies from the climate movement as you said you work in the uk with the extinction mm -hmm. rebellion here in the mm -hmm. netherlands we also work with extinction rebellion and other climate mm -hmm. Uh, groups uh, who are we mobilizing to yeah put this restorative justice toward the earth indigenous peoples etc and understanding it as a colonial uh, problem uh, to make to make it visible there and one of the questions yeah. from some of the people who are supporting us there uh, being moved by what you've said 
they ask, okay, uh, so in, uh, I'll just read it out. In terms of using terms such as Mangamizi in moving away from colonial language, what are your thoughts on white folks placing uh, in using the terms without potential cooptation and appropriation? So asking what is the right way to be supportive and not appropriative as allies? Yeah, we, we always have to be mindful of appropriation and co-optation. And I mean, it's like the way decolonize is just being thrown about these days. And, you know, we know if people have read that paper, decolonization is not a metaphor, right? It's not a term for equality, diversity, inclusion and all the other things. So there's always that danger. But from my perspective as an African organizer, I believe that part of the challenge is that the work we need to continue to do in our own communities to build the power that we can actually protect the terms that we have and ensure that people use them appropriately. So because many of our children are in so-called mainstream, which means white stream schools, um, it's in our interest to ensure that the curriculum changes, that it moves from just being a white curriculum that teaches about even the elite because it doesn't really serve white so-called working class people either. And so what we have argued is that there must be recognition of our knowledge systems, but how we hold on to that is to also advocate for what we call um, uh, community co-educators. So these are the experts within our communities who are not institutionalized, haven't necessarily been certified by the universities, but who promote our knowledges and build our own institution. So one of the institutions that is a tradition in the UK are the Saturday schools or supplementary schools movement, where we take responsibility for teaching our children what they don't get in the white stream schools. And I believe that part of power is being able to basically enforce your, your reality, your version of reality on the world. And it's in our interest that children of, of Europe who recognize that the, the way of the Mangamese is also bring about death for them, who want to be part of the repair. Yeah, because they know there's a lot of, you know, so-called white people that I've encountered in the kind of movements that I work across community, where they, they are recognizing that they have to take leadership from the first peoples, the first peoples of the earth including so-called indigenous people, so-called African people as well. And so we cannot deny people who want to be part of reinstituting truth that is re regenerative, that is restorative, that is, that is healing, as opposed to the truth of, you know, the, the untruths of coloniality. So I don't think we should be afraid of that because ultimately this is about a battle for hearts and minds. And we still recognize in our campaigning work that the Mangamizi is alive. It's not about just what happened to our ancestors. What's happening now is on our watch. So we've got a duty to stop that, you know, systemic harm that's happening today and to try and, and bring about liberation not only for ourselves, but other peoples. And what we've seen with the so-called black struggle led by people of African heritage, our movements influence the whole world. Yeah, and there's a new song that's come out by Common with Sean Kuti, and there's a line in it, when we lead, the whole world follows in our path. And that is just part of who we are and what we do. Um, and that is part of the responsibility of of being a, a vicegerent, a custodian, a mother and father of humanity. It's about time that we put things back and we create, we rebalance the earth, but we also have to rebalance ourselves in that process to do so. Thank you. I think these are beautiful closing words as we are moving to an end. Um, so uh, Esther, I really wanna thank you. And we're gonna make sure as to not appropriate, we're working on a letter, a manifest, how you wanna call it towards the climate movement. We'll make sure we use the term we just referenced to your campaign so people can find the source. So people mm -hmm. can find what you meant by it. Uh, and that way, uh, I think uh, 
uh, yeah, we, we uh, make sure it doesn't fall into a diversity inclusion uh, narrative. Uh, that would be a waste of the term. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, I want to thank Mr. Stanford especially, and also uh, I want to ask you for those who have enjoyed it to uh, give donations also this way we can also support Esther in her work and to make sure she can keep providing the quality that she gives and the time and the energy that she spends of uh, giving these lectures. Uh, we will send you an email with where you can donate for this. We will put it on our blog, the recording, so it becomes also available. Uh, so you can also share it afterwards with others if you found it resourceful. Uh, and also in our blog, we will include reading and listening sources uh, that were uh, together with Esther formed on the blog. So you can also read more because, yeah, one hour or two hours is not enough to cover this. You can spend years on these topics. So to help you with this, there will be some sources and book lists and things like this in the blog post posted as well. Uh, and for the rest, if you want to follow us on our newsletter, uh, you can go to our website to subscribe to a newsletter to find our activities and who knows in the future there will be a 1492 tribunal or something mm -hmm. coming up in different ways we'll we'll find the name i love the idea uh so yeah by that note uh i want to close the session thank you all thank you thank you <laughs>